afternoon all. I hope you're doing well. Uh, so this will be my contribution to the lectures for week six. And here we'll be talking a little bit about uh, the linkages or the connections between English language teaching and second language acquisition. Uh, like I did with the last in-class lecture that talked about uh, lesson planning um, and that activity toolkit, I'm going to use a similar breakdown for how we think about these connections between SLA and ELT. And so what I mean by that is we're going to look at this from the perspective of curriculum, syllabus, lesson plans, and materials, right? Um, keeping in mind that this framework kind of allows us to go from most general to most specific. Um, and in your early work, a lot of what you do will probably be around the lesson plan and materials level, but it's still good to understand how things work at higher levels so that you can understand the decisions that um, may be being passed down to you or decisions that you may have to make at some point in the future, right? Um, now, earlier in the semester, I think a couple of us kind of came up with the realization that what SLA gives us when it comes to English language teaching is really the why we do what we do, right? And so we're going to continue with this idea that SLA is the why, right? The ELT part is the, <laughs> the what we're doing and invariably how we're doing it. Um, but it's SLA, that theoretical foundation, that gives us the reason for why, right? So when we think of SLA's connection to curriculum, remember when we're talking about curriculum, we're talking about programmatic curricula, right? Uh, so these are things that govern the flow of an entire either series of studies or an entire program, right? Uh, most oftentimes, curriculum or curricula a couple of things that you should be aware of about it. <laughs> First and foremost, curricula often serve as um, that sort of, we mentioned this before, that overarching framework or purposeful design for a course of study, right? And this may include multiple classes at different proficiencies, like we would see in, for example, an intensive English program, right? Um, this may refer to a grade specific curriculum. So all of the learning that has to happen during second grade, for example, and just one part of that might be English language instruction, uh, <clears throat> for example, but it still has to fit into this broader framework, right? So what SLA gives us <clears throat> when it comes to curricula is SLA often serves as a foundation for purposeful decision making by curriculum designers, right? So by the people that are actually uh, developing the curriculum, deciding what the sequence of courses will be, what skills will be targeted, what the dominant teaching approach will be, right? Those are our curriculum designers. And SLA oftentimes serves in the ELT realm as that theoretical foundation, what they're using to guide their decision making and to justify the decisions that they make, right? Because when we're talking about, uh, sorry, when we're talking about curriculum design, in order for it to be purposeful, it needs a couple of things. First and foremost, good curricula needs to be needs-based, right? So oftentimes, the first or second step in uh, most curriculum design frameworks have us starting from what's called needs analysis, right? So identifying who our relative stakeholders are. This may be the students, the parents, the administration, the state, what have you, right? And then identifying what they think their needs are in relation to the educational program that we're developing, right? <clears throat> the other way that we make curriculum purposeful is by tying it to theoretical and disciplinary best practices, right? So what does the field of English language teaching consider to be good language teaching? What does it consider to be good programmatic design, right? And this is another thing that SLA helps us address in making this sort of purposeful uh, design decisions when it comes to the curriculum, right? And then finally, uh, what are any regulatory considerations as well? Um, and are any 
or let's say socioeconomic, sorry, socioeconomic, there we go, <laughs> constraints. This is what happens when I record your lecture after I get done with three hours of EAP lectures, <laughs> right? Um, so these are the things that we consider as we're engaging in curriculum design to make it purposeful, right? And SLA gives us the foundation for making purposeful decisions. And the way that I want to talk about this is I want to give you, uh, first and foremost, sort of what are some areas uh, that SLA can inform when it comes to uh, curriculum design, All right? And some of those areas that we see SLA touching would be things like considering course sequencing, right? So what classes will students take when? Are there going to be prerequisites before they can take a particular course? Will there be co-requisites so they have to take two or more courses together, right? And oftentimes this connects to that order of acquisition idea in some way, right? Or uh, what other theorists call the natural order, right? So it connects back to this idea that language acquisition is, uh, <clears throat> let's say, a semi-structured process that f typically progresses along, um, let's say, a limited number of pathways forward, right? And so because of this, we can use that, what we're accepting now as fact, um, as a tool then to make our decisions about uh, curriculum design, right? Another thing that SLA can inform when it comes to curriculum design then is either the role or the place of the first language in second language instruction, right? Um, <clears throat> So for example, if we take some of the earlier cognitivist work and we really, really sort of cling to this idea of L1 interference and fossilization, then we might be tempted to create English only, uh, sorry, English only guidelines for our, for our curriculum and for our staff, right? Um, if, however, we take a more social or sociocultural view, we might actually view that first language as an asset um, and make space for it in the classroom, right? We might not explicitly exclude it um, in our instructional policy, right? We might not punish students for using it, but instead uh, create places where we actually encourage its use, like it, during idea generation in a, in a speech and debate class, for example, we might allow them to fall back on the use of their first language while they're planning uh, their speech, for example, right? Um, another place that we see SLA touching when it comes to curriculum design is then uh, input and output, right? So what do we consider legitimate input for language, for language teaching in this, uh, in this sort of high level of the entire program, right? So are we going to encourage our educators to only use authentic texts and then scaffold those texts at different proficiency levels? Or are we instead going to <clears throat> encourage our educators to choose materials that come purpose-built for the English language classroom and for multilingual speakers of English, um, which may include pre-built-in uh, assistive devices, right? Things like um, close, close reading tasks that would help with vocabulary acquisition and reading comprehension. Um, or more explicit breakdowns of how particular genres or types of paragraphs work, right? As opposed to just giving them uh, particular genres to read and understand. <clears throat> Another area where we see SLA kind of serving as the foundation when it comes to curriculum design is in assessment, right? Um, so depending on the SLA theories that are driving our design decisions, this can then influence the kinds of assessments of learning that we'll carry out throughout the uh, throughout the course of study. It can then also influence the kinds of assessments that we as an organization value and accept from our, our teachers in their individual classes, right? Um, so <clears throat> if you're as a, let's say that you find yourself eventually in the position of an administrator or a curriculum designer, and you're using a predominantly social framework and a communicative 
uh, style of of language teaching, right, then you may prefer assessments that are based off of things like performance, production, and interaction, right? Uh, meanwhile, if you're using a, a more purely cognitivist framework and you're using something like, let's say, content-based instruction, for example, there may be alternative forms of framework, or uh, sorry, there may be alternative forms of assessment that would be considered more valid and more valuable in that curriculum design, for example, we may be more willing to accept things like the use of comprehension exams and multiple choice tests and, and the like, right? A more standardized form of assessment. So <clears throat> last week when we met, I asked if there was anything in particular that people wanted me to focus on. And some people were hoping that we could start to talk about, well, SLA, individual difference, and um, ELT linkages, right? How all of this kind of starts to work together. So I'm going to give you some examples of uh, what I mean with each of these categories, and I'm going to try to bring in uh, at least one of the individual differences with each one, right? So in this first, uh, let's call it our curriculum design example, right? We're going to be working with <coughs> an integrated skills program, right? Uh, so this would be something like that IEP, for example, um, which may or may not be serving an academic purpose. It might be serving a professional purpose. It really sort of um, depends, and it can vary from program to program, right? Um, and you'll recall that IEP stands for Intensive English Program, right? So. That's going to be our, what we're looking at in this example. The individual difference that we'll be concerned with for this one is going to be that, that sort of purpose or motivational differences, right? Because you'll recall that one of the big uh, sort of talking points when it comes to thinking about individual difference isn't just things like identity or age effects. It's also motivation or investment in the learning process, right? And the reasons why individuals engage in language learning can have a, a considerable impact on how they engage with that classroom space, the degree of effort they put into it, and what they get out of it as, as well, right? So let's say that we're designing a curric an integrated skills curriculum, so something that touches on reading, writing, listening, speaking, pronunciation, grammar, all together, right? Um, and we have different purposes that we might be targeting for, well, what does this mean for the decisions that we might make, right, when it comes to what that curriculum or how that curriculum should operate, right? So let's say, for example, that we were designing an IEP, an intensive English program, that is going to be predominantly used as a pre-matriculation program uh, for a secondary or post-secondary, sorry, uh, for post-secondary education, right? So this means that the majority of the students in this IEP are going to uh, leave the intensive English program and then go on to either community college or uh, career training or uh, four-year college or university, right? So this is what we're, we're designing for. And well, what are some of the things that or what are some of the different ways that SLA and ELT sort of interface here to guide our decision making? Well, we know that if they're going to matriculate into another post-secondary program, they're going to receive additional uh, education and they're most likely gonna have access to additional educational support, right? And so <clears throat> if we know that they're going to matriculate into a community college, for example, and that community college has additional ESL classes that they might be required to take, then what we can do is we can say, okay, given this set of uh, sort of institutional constraints and the needs of this population, we know that we need to prepare them for what comes next, right? Um, so this means then that that sort of natural order, right? becomes largely, or becomes, I should say, becomes partially determined by institutional need, right? We now have to ask ourselves, well, what is it 
that our students need to be able to do to, let's say, reasonably survive, if not thrive, ideally, uh, in their new institutional context once they leave our program, right? And so if we know, for example, that after they leave our program, all of them will require, be required to take, for example, uh, a public speaking course, right? We may then shift the focus of our cur curriculum to be more on pronunciation, presentation skills, and oral English, right? As opposed to on uh, written production and consuming text through reading, right? We may also then decide that we are going to place uh, at the end of that, um, towards the end of that uh, curriculum sequence, as students are getting ready to transition away from our program, excuse me, into their new home institution, we may then also build in, excuse me, additional uh, scaffolds, right, to facilitate that transition, sorry, transition from the IEP in this example to the new, parent, new uh, let's call it host institution, right? That, that community college or that four-year uh, college or university in this example, right? So what this means is in that final set of sequences, those advanced students then may also take something like a study, still, study skills course, right? Or they may take a course if it's an IEP that's actually embedded in the community college that these students will be going to afterwards, for example, which isn't an, isn't an uncommon design, right? It may also include a sort of uh, let's call it a first year experience course where they're introduced to the university in a more structured environment. Oftentimes we'll bring in guest speakers to talk about the different offices in the university and the different ways that we support student success. We'll talk about things um, like time management, right? Um, these are some of those decisions that we begin to make um, that relate to course sequencing or order of acquisition if we're thinking about an IEP that is uh, being largely used as a pre-matriculation program. Another thing that we might consider then is, well, what is the role of the first language and second language instruction? And in this IEP setting, we might decide to have sort of a, <clears throat> a, gradual, let's say that, a gradual reduction in L1 allowances, right? So that students that are taking more foundational courses at that uh, beginner or lower intermediate stage are more welcome to use the first language in uh, the second la first language in the classroom, right? We might also build in specific uh, or encourage educators to build in specific lessons that talk about using the first language as a metalinguistic tool, right? Or a metacognitive tool to help with uh, <laughs> completing assignments. Right, um, but as students progress through it, because we know that the, we'll, they'll be matriculating into a predominantly English language environment, we may start to to strip that away, right, and start moving towards a more English only model in the classroom. Now, when it comes to something like assessment, what this could mean is, in the case of a program where our students are going to matriculate into something else, we model our uh, our late stage or our later proficiency, higher proficiency level assessments on the kinds of assessments they'll encounter in their new educational context, right? So if, again, going back to this example of the IEP that's connected to a community college, for example, if we know that they're going to leave the IEP and that one of the first things that they're going to take in that community college is an English literature class or an English composition class, then in our reading writing class, we'll probably have a final assessment in there that isn't exam based, but is, but is instead based on a short paper, right? Maybe about half the length of what they'll be expected to produce in the upcoming uh, English composition or English literature class, right? <clears throat> 
Meanwhile, in our grammar class, that might focus <laughs> and use less examples uh, that are more from just sort of uh, basic everyday English and be more focused specifically on uh, academic grammatical usages, because there are some differences there between standard edited American English grammar and academic grammar when it comes to things like the use of passive voice uh, for certain things or the role of first person reference, right? Some of these things begin to shift um, on us as far as their expectations. So we might build that into um, how we <laughs> deliver that instruction and the kinds of materials that we use. And then of course, what we're actually assessing there, right? Uh, for example, in the, in the grammar, course at the very end we might be saying okay what we're going to assess is the student's ability to make decisions about best fit during ambiguous moments right um, so we're going to be pushing them more towards making agentive decisions about grammar that impact meaning making in situations where there isn't a clear yes no sort of answer right um, meanwhile at the beginning levels we might take a much more sort of um, prescriptive sort of view of saying okay well, can they produce expected grammatical forms when they're called for in a very specific context, right? And we may rely more on uh, multiple choice exams or uh, grammar correction exercises, things like that, right? Now, <clears throat> a different kind of intensive English program may be one uh, that is predominantly uh, focused on, let's call it, Skilling up, right? Um, skilling up is when an individual returns to some sort of formalized educational environment to acquire a new skill that will hopefully help them in the workplace, right? Um, and while somewhat less common today, I think, um, at least I should say less common for international students, perhaps still very common for uh, migrant and refugee learners, right? L2 learners as opposed, or SL learners, second language learners, instead of foreign language learners, right? <clears throat> so in these kind of programs where the primary focus is on skilling up, let's say skilling up, there we go, uh, for employment, most of our students may be uh, older learners, they may be adult learners, right? Uh, they may already come highly credentialed in their home country and in their, in their first language. They may already have years of professional practice, but they're coming and they're taking this intensive English class and they need the certificate at the end because if they take that certificate back to their employer, there's a promotion and a pay raise, right? Um, or perhaps they're, uh, uh, sorry, uh, perhaps they're recent immigrants to the United States and they're taking this as a way to make it easier to enter the U.S. labor market. Um, <clears throat> In this case, then, they might not need that certificate to acquire a, a promotion, uh, like I've seen some Japanese automakers do with their, with their senior management. They may instead be using this to overcome that initial barrier to entry, right? So we have this different motivation here, or this different purpose behind the IEP program. No longer are we preparing them for additional continuing education. Now we're preparing them to face some sort of high-stakes, labor-based, uh, <clears throat> let's say, labor-based gatekeeper, right, um, that will decide whether or not they enter a particular labor market or if they'll advance in that labor market. So because of this, the way that we use SLA theory to guide our decisions may change a little bit, right? So now, <sighs> natural order is no longer determined by institutional need, right? What we consider that that natural order is more connected to student need, right? Um, and where their, sorry, where their end goal sort of is for after they leave the program, right? So this then may allow us to create a more uh, compartmentalized curriculum. So for example, if we know that we're going to have a large co cohort of let's say auto executives in for one sequence and then we're going to have a large cohort of pilots in for the next sequence right we can then start to swap out some of the materials that we use that meet their specific needs right um, so instead of at the intermediate level 
just having a basic sort of academic vocabulary class, we can now have a specialized uh, English vocabulary for pilots class, right? And this is a thing that exists in, in some places because of how English is used for traffic control purposes, right? And there then the natural order might become, <clears throat> uh, instead of thinking like a morphological natural order, like some cognitive approaches to SLA, we're now instead thinking, okay, well, we can break up this uh, these vocabulary chunks into this is pre-flight vocabulary, this is in-flight vocabulary, this is pre-landing vocabulary, this is landing vocabulary, this is emergency vocabulary, right? Um, based on <coughs> sort of, uh, sorry, using the typical sort of flow of a flight as our guide for what that natural order might be, right? Now, uh, when it comes to something like this, we might have to accept that there may be few or no additional scaffolds after the student leaves the program. So we may instead focus uh, a small part of the curriculum on metacognitive and metalinguistic strategies. Right. So we might take additional efforts, additional explicit efforts, to help that student be self-sufficient after they leave us, right? So instead of help, helping that student identify offices on, on campus after they matriculate that will help them achieve success, instead helping them acquire the skills necessary that when they encounter a problem related to, to language or to communication, they can find a way to overcome that on their own, right? Um, and then finally, when it comes to something like assessment, when we have this sort of skill up um, IEP program, we may, instead of modeling our assessment at the later and higher proficiency levels on what our students will encounter afterwards, this may take the form of, or I should say, it typically takes the form of, of some sort of standardized exam language examination or language proficiency exam. Right, so um, one version of the TOEFL that um, <laughs> that that exists is something called uh, the institutional TOEFL. Right, um, it's a little bit different than the computer-based TOEFL or the standard TOEFL. Right, and so this may then become our assessment, and this is a little bit more grounded on um, cognitive approaches to second language acquisition. So we would necessarily start to build those approaches into the curriculum throughout, right? Now, sorry, I want to see how I did that, right? Um, you'll recall then from our lecture last week that the syllabus is sort of the class level realization of the curriculum, right? So if the curriculum guides overall decision making and overall flow of a course of study, the syllabus instead does this for an individual class for a constrained period of time, usually one term or one semester, right? So here, when it comes to SLA interfacing with the syllabus, here we oftentimes use uh, SLA used as a framework for syllabus uh, for syllabus planning, right? So thinking about how the course is going to progress, how we're going to support uh, learners throughout that course, uh, what kind of um, activities or assessments we're going to include, right? Oftentimes we'll use SLA to inform our goals and our means for that specific course, right? So we'll use SLA to say, okay, at the end of the beginner, uh, let's say the beginner speaking listening class, what is a reasonable expectation for the average student to be able to perform, right? And then this is where we would fall back on that second language acquisition research that looks at um, language acquisition, <laughs> excuse me, language acquisition over time. We would look at those studies that look at um, sort of proficiency bands and how proficiency bands have been determined more formally. Um, and we would also then want to consider uh, 
uh, SLA research on, on assessment, right? Um, that way we know how to measure that as well. The means are going to be then uh, what specific lessons or activities need to occur over the course of the syllabus to facilitate meeting uh, the stated goals of the course, right? Um, and this is where our theoretical grounding, whether it be cognitive, cognitivist, psycholinguistic, um, sociocognitive, or more purely social, like an identity-based framework, right? These will start to inform what goals we think are reasonable for the course and what specific means or uh, methods we're going to use to achieve that. So here, allow me to use the example of, there we go. I'm gonna use the example of the academic writing course, right? Um, because this is a pretty common one in intensive English programs and English for academic purpose programs and uh, across the two and four year college and university sort of framework, right? And the individual difference that we'll be working with this time will be proficiency level, right? So we're gonna focus specifically on, on language proficiency level this time, right? So how might the syllabus change and how might um, our use of SLA to inform our syllabus planning change based on these different proficiency levels. And I'm just gonna use the ones that are pretty standard for most um, intensive English programs that I've run across in the US, which are beginner, lower intermediate, um, upper intermediate, and then advanced, right? Sometimes there's an advanced one and an advanced two. Uh, it really sort of depends on what a particular cohort of students appears to need and what proficiency levels they they appear to have, right? So this distinction between lower and upper intermediate, most EAP or most IEP programs that I've run into will have um, these two uh, specific levels, right? Um, where lower intermediate for writing might be more focused on paragraphs, upper intermediate will be focused on short essays, maybe two, three pages long at the most, um, and then advanced, we're moving more towards a uh, more formal academic sort of style, right? We're looking at longer papers in these, maybe four or five pages, we're looking at the integration of source use and things like this. Um, at most community college or let, let me rephrase how I'm saying this, at most two and four year colleges and universities, uh, that ESL writing component will really be advanced one and advanced two, right? Where advanced one may still have some issues with uh, paragraphing and sentence structure. Um, they may not quite yet be able to properly integrate sources into their work, right? They might not have the metalinguistic awareness of um, some of the signaling devices that we use when we're integrating sources and giving credit where credit's due. They might have some organizational issues. Uh, meanwhile, Advance 2 is pretty close to what domestic students might produce as far as their written output, um, but there are some linguistic quirks that still need to be addressed, maybe some issues of, of, uh, of genre awareness, right? Uh, there may be some, still some issues with academic integrity that need to be addressed and with more advanced source use, right? So instead of using sources, period, um, using the right kind of sources. Um, advanced two courses also tend to more closely mirror um, advanced disciplinary writing or academic writing that students will encounter after they leave that particular program, right? So I've already kind of previewed for you what this means as far as goals and outcomes, but let's formalize this a little bit. So for an academic writing course at the beginner level, right, if this is our uh, marker for individual difference that we're concerned with, this may mean then that our syllabus focuses mostly on uh, lexical acquisition and word attack strategies, so vocabulary building, uh, basic grammatical correctness, right, And then probably uh, 
sentence structure will be um, sentence structure, let's say sentence structure and variation, will probably be our primary uh, areas that we're focusing on in the syllabus if it's, let's say, an eight or nine week course. Right. So this then give a, gives us our goals because we know that these things are foundational to what comes next. Right. A person at the lower intermediate level has to be able to successfully, probably about 75, 80 percent of the time, um, perform in these areas with relatively little uh, difficulty. Right. And so if I'm taking a more cognitivist approach to something like vocabulary building, um, <clears throat> excuse me, this may push us more towards the direction of maybe a little bit of rote memorization, maybe using things like um, closed reading, uh, maybe not relying as much on context, you know, uh, but it may also have us looking a lot at uh, example sentences to see how that uh, term is, is used in actual writing, right? Meanwhile, at the lower intermediate level, we may continue with lexical acquisition, but start to focus on more disciplinary or academic language, right? So this is where we start moving away from things and stuff and start talking about things like abstraction and nominalization, right? Uh, we may also start focusing in the uh, lower intermediate level on advanced sentence structure, so focusing more on compound complex sentences, right? We might also start talking about paragraph construction as well, right? So how do we start putting sentences together uh, to form a cohesive paragraph? We might also then talk about different types of paragraphs, right? And in this case, for example, if I were taking a more social approach, or if I were using social theories of SLA as my foundation here, then when it comes to something like talking about paragraphing with my students, right, instead of just using a generic uh, passage from a textbook, I might take an authentic text, for example, um, excuse me, uh, for example, a student paper or a student essay that was written about a topic like, uh, let's say, artificial intelligence, for example, um, and then rewrite that to be a little bit more accessible for ESL students, and then also include um, some additional linguistic support in there, for example, defining at the bot in the footnotes some key terms, right? Um, maybe simplifying some of the sentence structure and giving them this sort of modified authentic text as the material that we would use to talk about things like paragraph construction and types of paragraphs, right? Because it mirrors already then um, the way language is used in the community that they're going to be entering once they, once they finish the program, right? <sighs> Meanwhile, with the upper intermediate level, our focus is much more on uh, academic vocabulary, right? Um, and sentence structure. This may also be where we start to really uh, examine that difference between active versus passive voice and how we use it to... Um, excuse me, to construct uh, an academic text. We might still deal a little bit with sentence structure, but we'll probably be moving away from that. We'll now be moving uh, from paragraph uh, to papers or essays. I'm not a big fan of the term essays, really, right? So we'll be focusing more on how paragraphs work together and how to build um, what are called cohesive and coherent text, right? So once we start putting paragraphs together, and we can talk about things like transitional devices, for example, right? Uh, we can then start to talk about these two issues of cohesiveness and coherence, right? Coherence is this idea that a text works together on a high level and the same idea or the same controlling idea exists throughout the text, right? Um, meanwhile, cohesive means the individual paragraphs or parts of that text are working together well, right? With the upper advanced level, we would probably, we might move away from explicit, um, this one from explicit uh, vocabulary or lexical instruction. There might still be a little bit. Um, usually it takes a more implicit sort of form, right? 
or we might have like a words list that they fill out every week for a couple of points or uh, <laughs> we might just include some important academic terms in the lecture notes things like that right but really what we're focusing on is uh, putting paragraphs together into a cohesive text, using sources to support an idea, right, and maintaining, sorry, maintaining uh, academic style slash tone, right? So this is where we start to talk about things like that sort of objective sort of nature, uh, research narratives and things like this, right? Um, so we can see here how what we know from the field of second language acquisition about uh, sort of the needs and abilities of these different proficiency levels begins to inform them in the writing course, well, what are we going to cover when, right? Uh, so let's now zoom in to the lesson, to the level of the lesson plan, right? And the lesson plan, like we talked about in class, is what's going to happen, what is actually going to happen. on a given day or during a given module of instruction, right? And so here then, the way we see SLA being used most often, um, excuse me, is as a guide for our lesson planning efforts, right? And so what this means, for example, is as we're planning our lesson, if we're taking a more let's say a more socio-cognitive uh, perspective on our teaching, right? This might then be where we ask ourselves, okay, well, what scaffolds do my learners need, right? If we're doing something like um, uh, a reading comprehension uh, activity in class that day, should I also provide them with uh, a list of some of the harder uh, harder vocabulary items from that reading so that they can t attend more to the meaning of that reading overall instead of worrying about what individual words or phrases mean, right? Um, we might also ask ourselves, well, what do our learners already know about the topic or about the reading, right? We also might then ask, well, how can we get learners working together to extend their knowledge um, and performance on the on the task, right? On the reading comprehension task, right? So this is where we might then decide to deploy something like in an advanced reading writing class, a think pair share activity, right? Where instead of just diving right into our reading comprehension check, which might take the form of a, a discussion, for example, in a more uh, socially informed approach to, to English language teaching, right? Um, we might actually give them this think pair share activity. So first they take some time to kind of summarize their own understanding of the assigned reading. They share that understanding with a classmate and listen to a classmate um, share their understanding. They talk about any differences that they notice, any disagreements, and then you come together as a whole group, and then you have the group discussion that might serve as your uh, comprehension check, right? Um, excuse me. <clears throat> so, seeing as we're using our, our sort of theoretical knowledge of SLA as our guide, the other thing that this then does for us is provides us with justifications for doing what we do, right? Or for using the teaching tools that we've selected for a given day, right? So we might do something like say, okay, you know what, we're focusing on um, pronunciation today. Your personal teaching philosophy might be more, um, excuse me, <clears throat> might be more cognitively oriented, right? So you'll be looking for ways to activate students' previous knowledge about pronunciation, right? You might be pulling on uh, the first language a little bit to talk about similarities, right? Or to talk about differences in pronunciation. 
Um, this may open the door then for you to talk specifically about um, how certain sounds are articulated differently um, across languages, right? So that might, for example, be um, that that L sound ul, 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 um, in English and um, it's equivalent in certain uh, Chinese words and phrases, right? Uh, where the lips and tongue and teeth and throat move a little bit differently, right? Uh, so this is part of what it gives us access to at the lesson planning level. It also gives us then, um, beyond being a guide for saying, okay, these are the kinds of activities that I think will be best, or this is where I need to focus my energies for this class. It also gives us a way to go back and look at our lessons and lessons and say, okay, I've made the best possible um, instructional decisions that I can for this population, for this content, um, considering their previous their previous experiences, right? And so here, for our example, I'm going to use the grammar course. Right? And our the individual difference that we'll be focusing on this time will be age effects. Right? And so let's say that we're going to hold proficiency, um, kind of basic proficiency level, roughly the same. We're going to say they're high beginner, low intermediate, somewhere in there. Um, but we have young learners, we have a high school age learners, and we have adult learners, right? Sorry. Learners and this last one, adult learners, right? And all of them are at that upper beginner, lower intermediate level, right? <clears throat> so we're in this grammar course, and let's say that we're working with something like um, infinitives, right? So one of the things that we would know from SLA theory more specifically and from, um, from educational theory more broadly is that age effects begin to determine how much time we can spend on a particular task or activity, right? So we would know then that with the young learners, we're probably going to want to design a series of related tasks that are probably no more than five to 10 minutes long. Right, um, because the research shows us that learners after this period, or young learners after this period, it becomes a little bit harder to maintain their focus and motivation, right? Um, this is a little bit more cognitive, cognitivist in its leanings, right? Uh, meanwhile, for high school age learners, we might push that to be about 15, 20 minutes long for an individual task, so we can work on uh, the same kind of activity for a little bit longer, right? That will allow us to look at more examples. It'll allow for more individual feedback. And then for adult learners, it's about 25, maybe 45 minutes at the most. Right, really starts to fatigue after 45 minutes. Right, so I can use this understanding from SLA that's been informed by theories on, uh, sorry, uh, theories from developmental psychology, right, um, and neuroscience to determine, well, how long should I spend on a given task um, or on a, on a given uh, grammar instructional task based on their relative age level, right? Now, the other thing that we might bring in is we might bring in something like, uh, excuse me, we might bring in something like uh, sociocultural theory. That way we can start thinking about motivation, right? Um, and how uh, some of these uh, different age effects might impact something like motivation and maintaining motivation, right? So for young learners, this might mean uh, building in fewer sort of explicit or graded assessments, right? And sort of front-loading that, sorry, uh, front-loading positive reinforcement, for example, right? So using things like that gold star, telling them good job, you know, um, celebrating that sort of success with them when they really learn, right? 
Meanwhile, uh, for high school learners, uh, when it comes to this sort of age effect, uh, we start to see that sort of emotion-driven, self-focused sort of uh, nature start to give way to a more reason-based one, right? This is coming from developmental psychology, right? And so we might move away from this notion of, well, we're going to do fewer graded assessments. We're going to give a lot of positive praise where we can, right? Um, to giving graded assessments that mirror or reinforce uh, what's happening in their, in their mainstream courses, right? So things like in their biology course or uh, their English Lit course, things like this, right? We may also begin uh, adding in more critical uh, feedback of their work, right? So more specifically identifying error, calling it an error, you know, possibly taking points off for it, and then identifying strategies, explicit strategies for how they can improve, right? Uh, meanwhile, for the adult learners, you know, we may focus more on that sort of formative feedback, right? Uh, which would be that, well, here's how you improve in the future, right? Still kind of shying away from that explicit judgment of this is good or this is bad. Um, you have high grammar understanding, you have low grammar understanding, right? Um, but more looking at, okay, well, <laughs> when we have something like uh, the use of the infinitive and we have it in um, a sentence, right? Instead of just giving that sort of, um, sorry, uh, that more reductive sort of never ever split infinitives, right? Um, that more prescriptivist sort of advice, we say, okay, well, yeah, ideally you shouldn't split your infinitives and there's a reason for that. But one of the things that we notice when we have kind of more colloquial genres of writing, right? Um, it's very common for that to be split and it's not a problem. It doesn't cause interference of meaning. So we can start to say, okay, well, think about uh, how context might shape grammatical choices, right? Um, so that's the other thing that we then begin to notice as we move from young learners to um, adult learners. We might m go from relatively prescriptivist in our approach of this is how it's done, right, um, to more descriptivist. of saying these are the options that are available in language, and this is how you choose uh, in a way that facilitates meaning making, for example. Now, when it comes to materials, we're thinking here of either materials selection or materials creation, which are two slightly different things. Um, admittedly, novice teachers tend to select materials that they either find online or that come from a course textbook. Uh, more advanced practitioners start moving more towards creating their own materials, right? Um, but one of the things that, sorry, uh, one of the things that SLA gives us for this is a method for either materials creation or uh, material selection, right? And how that connects back to, um, sorry, how that connects back to our specific educational context. So what this then means then is as we take our sort of teaching philosophy, which is based on this theoretical understanding of how people acquire languages, we can then use that as a methodology. You know, let's say methodology instead. Uh, to guide us as we pick materials for the course, right? We can use this to help develop our own sort of uh, rubric or heuristic to consider, well, what are the nature of these, the course that I'm teaching and what does this mean for, for the materials, right? So if I'm in 
um, a two or four year college ESL writing class, well, then I know that part of the nature of that class is to support students as they transition from their home institutions, uh, potentially in a foreign country, to the United States and to help acculturate them to North American uh, academic expectations, which means then that I might choose more naturalistic, uh, more naturalistic materials, right? I might not choose an ESL writing textbook. I might actually choose uh, a, a writer and composition textbook that's been designed for um, native speakers, right? Because that's what they're going to encounter next. And uh, I can scaffold that material in a particular way in the course, right? I might also then uh, use my uh, my background theoretical knowledge and second language acquisition to then consider, well, what um, what's the focus of these materials going to be, right? Am I going to provide mostly abstract sort of resources that just talk about general, um, sorry, just like general application, right? So am I just, just going to give a, a basic sentence structure worksheet to my students that has, you know, uh, syntactically sound sentences, but don't really mean much, right? So things like uh, I chased, I was chased by the dog and I fell and skinned my knee, right? And if we're talking about, for example, a compound sentence, right? Or am I going to give my students a sentence structure worksheet that has, for example, uh, sentences that talk about, let's say, data analysis, for example, if I have a class filled with uh, data science students, right? So here now the example isn't just, um, or the material isn't just sentence structure. It's sentence structure grounded in the discipline or field of study that my students are going into, right? And sometimes you get lucky and you have a, a course that has all students in that one discipline, right? Like GW occasionally offers a an EAP writing course for data science. I think we also occasionally offer one for uh, physics or law, I forget, but this allows us then to make different decisions about well, what the what the content and focus of that material that we're either creating from scratch or that we're picking from um, a library of resources or the internet to make those decisions in a more meaningful sort of way, right? Uh, the other thing that it then allows us to consider then is <laughs> something like, well, how are we going to support learners as they use these materials, right? Is the material itself the support? For example, something like um, an academic words list. Or are we going to build in activities that support the learners while they use that instructional material, right? Are we going to have them working in pairs, for example? Are we going to revisit this particular resource again later on in the in the lesson or later on in the the semester, right? Um, are we going to have students re-engaging with that potentially in a new way, right? And if so, well, how are we going to use that to extend uh, <coughs> their learning, right? And so my example here, and I'm going to try to be quick because I'm already running up on an hour. I didn't think I would, but you all know that I can talk and talk way too much, right? is going to be the reading course, right? An ESL reading course. And our individual difference here will be a more contextual difference, right? So we're going to say an institutional contextual difference. Right, so how might being in something like, let's say, um, uh, no, let's not say K-12. Let's narrow that down a little bit. Let's say a 6 to 12 ESL tutoring program or English tutoring program versus, uh, let's say, the intensive English program, uh, intensive English IEP reading writing course versus, let's say, uh, the postgraduate professional writing or professional reading writing course. Let's call it a literacy course. Well, how will these different contexts potentially change the way that I go about making my decisions about what sort of materials to use um, in the course and how does my larger sort of theoretical understanding of second language acquisition inform that?
Well, if we're doing something like reading comprehension, for example, as sort of our end goal for whatever the lesson is, for whatever we're using the material for, right, uh, with these different uh, contexts, I might make different decisions. So here I might instead use, in the 6 through 12 setting, I might use a graduated reader, uh, perhaps that focuses on some either historical or uh, probably U.S. societal figure, right? Um, because now it's going to serve that purpose of um, not just addressing, uh, excuse me, not just addressing language because it's a graduated reader. So the sentence structure and the vocabulary choice has been keyed to a specific proficiency level, right? Um, but we're also dealing with some minor acculturational work by talking about U.S. history or um, society, right? That might be one decision that I make there. Now, I might decide to then also pair that graduated reader with a keywords list that students fill out as we read sections from, from that book, right? So that as we move through the book, we can work together then to fill in blanks in their, in their lexical understanding that way as they continue to work with that text throughout the course of the week, the month, the semester, whatever, they don't have to keep trying to attend to meaning of individual words, right? They have this words list that they can go back and that they can refer to, right? And that becomes a scaffold to help them with their understanding so that they can focus more on overall reading comprehension, right? I may then also decide, well, how am I going to build group work into the comprehension, the reading comprehension lesson plan, right? And so what this might mean for me for materials, is it might mean that I have to develop, for example, an, in, an info gap uh, worksheet, right? Where one person's worksheet has one set of information, the other person's worksheet has a different set of information. It's both related to the text that, that the students are reading, but they have to work together with that text, their indiv individual knowledge, the knowledge that they have on this worksheet to come to some deeper under understanding or comprehension of that text and its meaning. Right. Meanwhile, in the IEP writing course where I know that part of what I'm trying to do is to prepare them to enter the two-year college or the four-year college or university, right, the kinds of materials that I pick might be different, right? Instead, here, I might move towards, or I might be, let's say, uh, let's say bias towards, uh, but bias here I'm not using to have a, a negative connotation, just bias towards uh, more authentic sources, right? So here I might try to use um, example papers from, let's say, a first or second year writing class, right? I might actually use um, newsletter articles from uh, professional organizations, not research, not research articles quite yet, but newsletter articles that are still very formal and academic in tone, but are shorter and typically targeted at a more uh, sort of general audience, right? So I might be biased towards more authentic materials that I select, right? However, I might still have to build in some scaffolding uh, materials. This might be things like uh, worksheets or uh, summary logs, reading logs, right, that support the learner in using that more authentic material, right? I may also allow more time uh, to engage and to re-engage with a text right? Because this is what we know about how we use text in academic settings. We don't typically just read something once. We'll usually read it and then read it in conversation with something else, or we'll reread it later um, to help come to a deeper understanding of that. So I might have to allow time in my, in my lesson plan to allow for that. And then I might also have to develop uh, perhaps worksheets or reading guides, right, that facilitate that re-engagement with the text uh, to highlight how it may change 
sort of comprehension, uh, reading comprehension, right? right? Meanwhile, when it comes to material selection for that postgraduate uh, reading course, I will use almost 100% uh, uh, authentic text, right? Here I would be selecting perhaps a, a small library of research articles in the students uh, or in a variety of disciplines, right? And then here I might use uh, let's say uh, use group worksheets, for example, or use wikis. This is another thing that I've often seen used in this case, right? But using a group worksheet or uh, a wiki of some sort where groups actually look at the differences in how the authors slash disciplines uh, share knowledge through uh, reading materials, right? So here we might choose a, a resource from sports medicine that talks about, um, let's say, COVID-19 and its impacts on 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 sports and athleticism. I might pick a resource from hotel management or resort management that talks about COVID-19 and its impacts, and I might pick one from education, right? And then different groups would read these three different texts, and then each group would contribute to a wiki of, well, this is how um, we see them talking about um, COVID-19 and its impacts in this particular area, this is kind of evidence that we see them using, right? Uh, and then from there, we can then look at all the wikis together as, as a group and then uh, start to say, okay, well, in this discipline, they use a lot of passive voice while talking about COVID-19 and this impacts. Meanwhile, in education, they're using a lot of active voice. Why might they be making these decisions, right? How does it change the way that a person engages with the text and understand what they're trying to say, right? Um, so there is my... <sighs> somewhat imperfect attempt to start talking about SLA and its ELT linkages, right? Thinking specifically of how it interacts with curriculum, syllabi, lesson planning, and materials, right? Um, and also trying to address this question of, well, what does this actually look like in different contexts, right? Um, I may have tried to do a little bit too much with this lecture, but you'll have to forgive me. That's what happens when I'm excited about the content. And, uh, also when it's my, my first time giving this specific lecture. So thanks so much, and I'll see you in class next week.